just wait for that to start recording. I think we're OK. Mm -hmm. um, OK, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. My name is Lindsay Anderson. I'm from uh, University of Exeter in the UK and I'm joined here this afternoon with Joe Salter, who was one of our community partners on the Tidelines project, which we spoke briefly about earlier. And we'll talk about a little bit more in detail in a few minutes. We've also got Tim um, and Philip, I think, from the University of Magdeburg, who are going to be talking um, a little bit about their project. And we've also got Andy Dean with us, who's going to be moderating this afternoon. So just a little bit of structure. We just thought we'd give a, a few minutes to just sort of trying to sort of talk about what is place based community engagement. Um, and then we're going to present two case studies. So I'm, I'm going to um, present with Joe a little bit about Tidelines here in Exeter. And Tim is going to talk about um, the project that they conducted in Magdeburg, looking at the cultural landscape of the city. And then we should have about sort of 20, 25 minutes um, where we're hoping for a really rich discussion about what place based community engagement is and perhaps, you know, whether you've looked at this approach elsewhere or if we've got any um, thoughts or, or questions about that. So that's the, the format. So just thinking about what place based approaches are and if you if you look these up, if you Google place based approaches, you'll see that there are all sorts of different definitions out there. Um, place based approaches and engagement are used in all sorts of different sectors and settings, um, but very commonly they are used when connecting with community organisations and voluntary groups. Um, I quite like this definition here, which is from the Queensland government, which um, describes it as um, collaborative long term approaches to build thriving communities delivered in a defined geographic location. This approach is ideally characterised by partnering and shared design, shared stewardship and shared accountability for outcomes and impacts. This is another similar but different definition um, talks about person centred bottom up approach used to meet the unique needs of people in one given location by working together to use the best available resources and collaborate to gain local knowledge and insight. So place based is, is really it's, it's all about collaboration. It aims to build an understanding of a place from a local perspective and place based approaches are usually also asset based in that they seek to build on the strengths, capacity and knowledge of everybody that's involved. So within the higher education context, place based community engagement is generally seen as a long term university wide commitment to a specific university or geography. Place based partnerships are generally driven by a geographically defined community need um, and they can offer opportunities for members of the public and for communities to actively contribute to research and innovation projects that impact upon their own lives. This could be anything from flood mitigation, reducing air pollution or improving access to healthcare, anything generally that, that is, you know, affects them. Place based community engagement can provide a powerful way for universities to connect their campus with their community neighbours and to foster a positive social transformation. Um, typically, projects may emerge in a number of different ways. They may just grow organically from a, an individual researcher or a faculty or from an existing relationship with a specific community. They may also grow organically from a bottom up response to, to urgency or an emergency. Or they may be the result of a more top down strategic directive uh, to address specific societal needs. So these are just some of the things that place based approaches might include. Always meaningful engagement, not just tick box exercises, but you know, engagement that probably means something. Um, and then through that, identifying and working on community priorities, responding to complex, often interrelated and challenging issues. Um, looking at collective and collaborative action and partnership with communities, so sort of doing with um, communities and not on or, or for them. A focus on building on the community's strengths, capacity and capability building. There's normally a long term focus, so we're not talking about one off short term projects normally, you know, we're talking about long term vision with um, long term investment. And they often use quality data and information to help guide decisions. And this is normally sort of rounded off by an appropriate governance structure. 
So this is quite a nice depiction of a place based approach. It depicts the cyclical nature of the process um, or the, the cycle of integrated learning. I think they call it somewhere. There you go, cycle of integrated learning. So it includes finding a fair, shared vision, building a plan for change, enacting the plan, but also reviewing and renewing it and also sort of growing an understanding of the place in which you're working. So Tidelines is an example of a place based project which emerged from um, the interest of, of two people really in Exmouth near Exeter in the UK. And um, I, I just think this is a really nice example of a, a place based approach. Um, so Tidelines had links with the University of Exeter and started building relationships with organisations, schools and environmental groups along the accessory in 2018. So I don't know whether you can see my pointer here, but uh, this is this is Exeter. This is where the university is. Uh, the River X rises up here somewhere near the North Devon coast, comes down through Exmoor. And this is the X, um, X estuary, which comes out here in Exmouth on the south coast of Devon. Um, and in 2020, we formalised the collaboration between Tidelines and the university through the Socially Engaged Universities project with Joe, who's here today, and his partner, Anne-Marie, being employed as community engagement managers on the project. So Tidelines has been exploring how the university can work better with communities, how we can share knowledge and research and be better informed by the real needs and interests of communities. The project brings together knowledge about science, arts, crafts, history, places and nature, and makes connections between different ways of experiencing and understanding the world. They've created multidisciplinary activities and events to develop collaborations between communities and the universities, so that's academics and scientists. Um, and these, these activities have helped people sort of think about the estuary and celebrate what's happening, but also think about specific research questions and things that they feel um, are priorities for them and things that they want the university to help them respond to specifically in the area of, of climate emergency. I'm here, Les Lindsay. OK, right, Joe, do you want to well, just, uh, do you want to take over from here then? Um, right. So, yeah. Whereabouts are you? I can see you're on a slide that says Ames. Ames, yeah. Yeah, you have to take over from there, Joe. OK, um, well, our, uh, hi, I'm, in case you don't know me, I'm Joe Salter, um, artist, illustrator, um, and uh, Tidelines coordinator. Um, our aims, um, our our motivation as an organisation um, or as a group, um, began primarily as um, response to climate change. Um, the wish to create a community discussion, resilience, and adaptation and also to celebrate where we live. Um, let's see, uh, what does it say here? Um, yeah, encouraging dialogue about the estuary and how it's changing and it's affecting it, the effects of uh, changing biodiversity uh, on the entire ecosystem. Um, and to facilitate university research to feedback into a dialogue with the communities. I mean, it's a, it's a process um, in which it's, uh, it's just quite a long process uh, over a period of time of community engagement, which uh, initially uh, re uh, requires um, stimulating inquiry and interest in this uh, uh, location, this large natural phenomenon, uh, which you can see in front of you, this, uh, in between the tides uh, ecosystem. And... Um, then gathering an audience and participation um, through various uh, innovative uh, techniques, which involve involves uh, developing multiple visions of the location. In other words, it's a very general, uh, you know, pulling in people from all different strands of life who are in one way or other are affected by the estuary and therefore are likely to care for it in the future. Um, and then the next part of the process is to take it through to um, uh, developing those developing uh, dialogue 
with the university, uh, which is uh, grown out of the community itself. Um, and these can be taken further forward into research uh, questions. Now, let's see what it says here. Um, yeah, raising questions and co-designing research, which is what I described. Um, we're trying to develop, yes, a blueprint for, for these kind of collaborations. Um, our background is in, um, in the arts uh, and sciences and uh, innovative ways of, uh, if you like, stimulating those discussions and broadening the visions of all participants uh, in, in the process. Um, uh, key to that would be that uh, communities have got a great deal of knowledge about their uh, local area, their observations, their use of it, and therefore this is this is a two-way dialogue. Um, and yes, commu community resilience and adaption I mentioned earlier on. Um, the attitudes to climate change have changed. Um, well, they appear to be changing, um, but slower than it than you might think in the last uh, two to three years. And so, from the in, the inception of this of tidelines, the creation of tidelines to now, um, it's a moot point about how much more discussion, how much more public awareness has grown over that time. For sometimes I think it's great, sometimes it's not so great. Um, so moving on. Um, yeah, these are kind of the primal questions that Tidelines is um, is based on asking. Um, what do we want to know about our changing estuary and coast in the past, the present and the future? Um, how can we celebrate and learn more about the ex-estuary? And how can we be active in responding in our communities as individuals to the environment and climate crisis? Um, so the first part of that process is I, um, a celebration, if you like, um, a focusing on a, an object that in the, the estuary itself which doesn't necessarily have such a huge focus on it uh, every day. So it's not something that people know a great deal about, even though they live around it. So um, and uh, taking that through. Um, so the first part is getting those questions, is getting that feedback, is finding out what people want to know what people uh, are curious about, what issues they're concerned with. Um, so, where was I? Yes, yeah, sort of getting to know your home. So, um, uh, yeah, we had a series of events planned for uh, the year before COVID came along. And these uh, involved um, lateral activities or combination activities where you might have a film or a book discussion or a show, you know, an outdoor screening. Um, and combining these events in order to, uh, again, uh, raise the main topics around the estuary and to find out what people thought. So COVID, hello, um, we decided to, to do what so many other people do, try and make this work online. And we found that there were both advantages and disadvantages to this. Uh, perhaps the main advantage would be that people did have, uh, online became more important for people, therefore, and they had more time on their hands and uh, and also potentially more connection with the natural world. So um, so it wasn't all negative. Um, so we created these online activities. Um, they are uh, this much the same in the sense in terms of themes as we would have been doing live face to face in those activities we had planned. Um, they are, as you can see, designed to appeal to a broad range of skills. Um, it's a kind of fundamental um, teaching technique, if you like, because not everybody wants to write and not everybody wants to draw. So you have uh, all these activities and they were um, some, you know, some taxing, some not so taxing. There was a diary, there is a mapping activity. Um, so, and yeah, or a simple photography activity. And asking questions very specifically, you could ask questions that you didn't know about your estuary. Um, these these can be fed back through the website, so they help to build up um, a collection of all of these activities. So um, it really started to build up a picture of how the estuary uh, as how what people's estuary interests are. Um, 
Can I have the next slide? Yeah. Um, connections. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, throughout that time of throughout the, the year, um, we built up as many connections as we could through a variety of different means. Um, partly through inviting, uh, um, creating events or online events or occasionally in, when it was permitted small group events in which uh, academics and scientists, marine biologists um, were invited along to, to join a group, um, a discussion group with uh, members of the community. We covered a number of different subjects, including um, uh, water quality, the changing sea temperatures, um, just two examples there. Um, let's see what have I got here. Yeah. So, um, public group themed events. Um, let's see which slide is this. One second. Sorry, Joe, are you all right? Yeah, I'm just trying to see where, 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 what, what my notes were on this particular page. Oh, okay. Sorry, am I going too fast? No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I would just say that um, we, we ran a number of activities. I mean, there's too many to mention, really, uh, over the year, in which uh, we brought people together in, in various different ways. Um, in, there were online discussions, as previously mentioned, the, in, you know, one on, on the water temperature, for example, which is um, a, there was uh, a 12 hour um, online event in which we invited, uh, we had 50 different contributors from literally all over the world um, contributing in a fascinating day, uh, which involved science and the arts. Um, throughout the entire day, mostly just discussing. A lot of it was to do with uh, cities and um, uh, uh, mitigation activities like uh, the planting of uh, the, the erosion in estuaries, basically, in, for example, in the Sundarbans in India, or is that Bangladesh? Um, the, uh, other, we had uh, discussion events where we put out, uh, for example, Richard Carson book, in which we brought together uh, 100 members of the community uh, online, but also in little groups of six to discuss a book which raised uh, the enthusiasm through the local people's enthusiasm for um, marine marine activities, marine, marine issues, uh, along with other marine biologists. And this created a very fertile discussion around this book. Um, we uh, trying to think other ones. That's just two examples. There are quite a lot. Um, yeah, we invited people to also from the community to contribute blogs to our website. If you get a chance to look at our website, it's actually very diverse and very busy. Um, so at this, just to give you a general picture, we are pulling in all these connections um, through from the community, uh, f from uh, different experts in their field and uh, at the same time raising questions. Uh, now, those are the five activities that were online to um, try and create something in the real world. We developed this uh, box, which could be delivered by bicycle. The estuary is not very big. You could cycle all around it in about ooh, 10 hours. Um, so th these could be delivered uh, all around the estuary for people to do. And again, this is one of the advantages or perhaps making the best of the COVID situation because we were, these could be given to people, they could then do these activities at home, which they then fed back to us. And what you're looking at there is, um, there are, there's an almanac in front, which is a diary, which you could write down your observations either now or in the past of specific dates and events. Um, they were fascinating. Then there's the questions, which is questions, uh, which things you simply don't know. It's wonderful how much we don't know asking people to feedback their questions. Uh, we had many of those and the huge discussions about that. Um, the next one is your estuary map. Mapping is, if you like, a kind of uh, symbolic of um, the diversity of vision that people have about one thing, that they cannot draw a map that is the same without expressing themselves. So 
we have got a huge variety of wonderful maps, which again tells us how people see it, whether you're a fisherman, whether you're a swimmer, whether you're a sailor, whatever you may be, you will have a different vision of that place. Um, and there are other things in there too. A letter to the sea invites people to um, uh, to express their, their feelings about, yeah, about the sea. Now, that accessory box, plus everything that is on, that came on the website and came from those same activities, was um, brought back together and uh, eventually uh, it, we presented this around the estuary in two events in which, uh, which you can see before you in these photographs. Um, these were put in, in very public locations. The estuary has a cycle path all the way around it, so um, there's a constantly moving uh, groups of people. Um, so the, we were very exposed to public and that was fantastic after all this time. And it was great to see just what a difference that makes when you can actually talk to people. And the discussions uh, and feedback were amazing on that day. But this is, uh, if you like, the full stop on this part of the project because Although we will go on collecting data and collecting how people feel, um, some uh, it's quite clear in some cases what uh, many uh, what the questions are that people are interested in, and these have risen to the surface uh, quite clearly, which gives us a guidance on what we should take forward into the future in our collaboration with academics, the scientists, the university, and the community in some form of citizen science. Uh, or citizen uh, generated question research. And I can give you an example of this that is uh, currently uh, off the starting block it has started, which is uh, to Sorry, do. I, just, I, I, I do want you to tell this, but can you just do it really, really quickly? I'm just, just afraid that we're going to run out of time. <laughs> it's so, I'm so bad at this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, very, very quickly. Yes, we have, we're running a project on water quality at the moment, which has already had its, its, in, in, its uh, initial meeting and its partners are gathering from the community, from other organisations, from the Rivers Trust, from the Environment Agency, all together. And this will be a uh, community-led, community-acted um, process in which the research is done by the community uh, individually in using all the latest kind of innovative techniques which will be of great value to uh, the Environment Agency and other people interested in water quality. Is that it? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Joe. There's there's a couple of, of um, images here as well, but I'm, I'm not going to dwell on these because they, they basically sum up the process and they are available in the toolkit. So I'll just show you them because they are beautiful images, but they basically sort of sum up all of the different activities and again sort of show the cyclical nature of the um, of the process that, that Tidelines has, has been going through. But um, that's that's basically it. Just as very, very briefly to sum up, you know, what's next for Tidelines? Um, we are going to try and continue to develop the um, and expand the Tidelines community. Um, so that, that means you know more, more people along the X trying to and feed into this process and the feedback sessions that we had last week were very indicative that people really do want this to continue. I'm um, going to try and further develop links with the university, try and continue to respond to community identified research questions, but also get more of the researcher led talks to come back out to the, the communities to sort of again feed into that cycle. Um, and what's really, really important as well for Joe and Amory is trying to find a way of making this sustainable. Um, so trying to find a structure that, that works, that incorporates um, other members of the community taking this on, that doesn't depend upon them being so, um, so hands-on all the time and isn't dependent upon external funding. So that's basically Tidelines in a nutshell. I can hand over to, to Tim now to talk about um, Magdeburg and the cultural landscape. So I'll, I'll stop sharing, Tim. If I can yeah. find out how to. Sorry, so can I interrupt just one minute? Because I think that the two parallel sections are uh, all in this one. I think that that group should be in the other parallel section. I don't know what happened because I uh, go out from the other one and when I come back, there was no one. So I don't know if you decided to go all in because there were not much people or... Yeah, Katia. No. 
We were actually with four, three of the. Ah, okay, okay. So you decided this. Okay, okay, okay. okay. One guest. So that okay, it, make sense. Okay, so. okay. It, it was just because if you want to have some minutes to present your part in this session, you can do it. Yeah, okay, be... sorry. Sorry, okay. if I realized that, we could have whizzed through that a lot quicker. I am sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> but if we're all here, I, you know, we can perhaps spend a little bit more time because I don't think the whole feeding back session will yeah. take that much yeah, longer. That makes good sense. Yeah. yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Um, is um, anybody able to um, uh, give me the rights uh, to uh, for sharing my screen? Um, that would be good. Maybe from the Parma team somewhere here. Can... Oh. Ah, okay, yeah. great. That Are you works. Able now? Okay. I'm able to do it. Okay, you should see my PowerPoint presentation right now. Okay, great. And now it's red, right? <laughs> okay. Um, yes, uh, for um, um, for everyone who don't know me, um, I'm Tim Flügge. I worked as a researcher um, at the University of Magdeburg um, in the Socially Engaged University project. Um, I'm very pleased for the opportunity to um, yeah, give you some insights into the a uh, community university partnership we set up here um, uh, in Magdeburg, and um, yeah, I, I will uh, want uh, I want to give you a really brief over, uh, overview of our project goals and our objectives, our methodology, etc. But I will do it really short, so we have a lot of time for discussion as well. Um, Philip, um, if you want to add something or um, you have some idea, um, uh, then just feel free to jump in. Um, we can uh, see this presentation more as a, a talk as well. Um, in Magdeburg, we started a collaboration with the project team from the municipality that worked on the application for the title European Culture in uh, um, European Capital of Culture in 2025. And then later, after um, the bidding process failed, um, the um, team worked on the cultural a strategy in Magdeburg, uh, what's called um, Magdeburg uh, 2030. And um, our main project partner there was Kerstin Hartinger. She worked as a project manager um, on the bidding process, and she was in um, contact with uh, Philip Polens, uh, who is the chair for higher education research at the University of Magdeburg. Um, unfortunately, Kerstin is not able to join the conference today because um, she started a new job at the cultural office in the city of Leipzig. That's the largest city in um, Germany, um, quite near to Magdeburg, um, as well as seated in the east of Germany. Um, but Kerstin um, asked me to send best wishes out to everyone who joins our session. And she is very happy as well that we can provide some insights into our project to you. Um, yeah, to the context at first, um, just like I said, we connect, uh, connected our project to the bidding process of um, Magdeburg um, becoming the European capital of culture in 2025. And um, yeah, basically we wanted uh, from our side, from the university side, we wanted to support this, um, this process. Um, and the application process. And um, we agreed with um, Kerstin Hartinger um, and the project team um, to provide new knowledge about the cultural life in Magdeburg to, uh, to them, which they then can use into the, um, the, um, in, in the application and the bidding process, etc. Um, um, we also had the idea that we uh, provide some feedback and, and discussions based on our project findings and with that we wanted to unleash pot, uh, potentials for the further development of the cultural landscape in Magdeburg. Um, if you are interested in a detailed description of the project and um, everything we did, um, you can um, have a look um, in our pilot uh, uh, Report which is on, uh, um, uh, that is online and it's the um, on the CU pro, uh, project uh, pro project um, website. Um, there you find a lot of information um, as well as in the toolkit. Um, yeah. Um, 
we co-designed with Kerstin um, a lot of different research questions and ideas on um, which we focus then um, in our project. And um, we had there mainly two focuses. One um, was on understanding the um, non-participation in Magdeburg. Um, Kerstin said that during the application process where she was in contact with a lot of people who work in the culture scene in Magdeburg, there is this um, a high interest on, uh, in the question why people do not come to our um, events. Um, there we agreed to do a representative um, survey research um, and use statistical analysis to um, uh, um, yeah, to in, in, in order to know more um, about this phenomenon of staying away from cultural offering, offerings, um, what are the reasons for not participating um, and what kind of factors um, are there in the game um, uh, when it comes to non-participation in Magdeburg's cultural life. Um, and on the other hand, we agreed with um, Kerstin, uh, Kerstin Hartinger that we um, want to um, generate some new knowledge about um, the dynam dynamics which are um, uh, um, which influence the, uh, the, the cultural landscape of Magdeburg um, by itself. Um, we were interested in the question how is the cultural landscape in Magdeburg shaped and um, how are cultural actions taken in Magdeburg by um, stakeholders from different positions, um, how are the relationships between um, these players uh, who are active in, in the cultural scene in Magdeburg, um, and how they perceive their audience, um, and what kind of um, audience, audience at attraction and development strategies um, are they using. Um, for this, uh, we um, we went for a qualitative approach um, with open guided um, interviews and um, a grounded theory um, uh, style coding and interpre interpretation process of the data. Um, and um, because we weren't able to do everything by our own, just Philip and I, um, we made use of um, Philip's um, teaching duties. Uh, Philip is um, professor of uh, um, for higher education research um, in Magdeburg, just as I said, and um, um, with his teaching duties, we were able to um, recruit um, 30 students um, from the subjects uh, or, the, or the, um, the degree pro pro programs, cultural engineering and social science. Um, and um, they were um, keen about uh, working in this project and uh, working with us together um, in order to um, yeah, generate some new knowledge and um, uh, some feedback formats for the city of Magdeburg as well. Um, uh, in the su summer term in 2020, um, we spent due to the pandemic um, uh, most of the term on qualifying the students and setting up sub projects for everyone. And then in the winter term, um, uh, 20, 2021, we launched the, the project and the field work. Um, due to the pandemic, um, we had to postpone our um, our first project, the understanding of the non-participation in, in Magdeburg. Um, there, we we had a, a, a cooperation with the um, uh, Office for Statistics um, from the city of Magdeburg as well, and they said um, we should um, do the survey and um, uh, when when the pandemic is not so um, urgent anymore. Um, uh, because uh, there won't be people who would participate at uh, this kind of survey, which makes totally sense. But this uh, project part spends uh, uh, spended the, the time for a um, for the preparation of the project, and um, that will something uh, Philip will do um, later. Maybe Philip, you can say uh, something to that um, later in the discussion how it's going on. Um, I'd like to focus now um, on the second project um, of the exploring of the dynamics in the, uh, in the cultural landscape of, of in Magdeburg. And um, at first I'd like to show you kind of our place there. Um, we found out uh, with our focus on stakeholders um, that the cultural landscape in Magdeburg is a is a field, a social field, where a lot of different stakeholders are um, cooperating and um, are uh, uh, suited um, uh, and uh, the variety of um, 
yeah, cultural institutions, so to say, is really, really high. We got a lot of different um, uh, kind of institutions there. We got city project, we got um, um, education organizations, we got artists, we got um, unions of artists who are they're organized, we got uh, subcultural associations, um, we have um, uh, yeah, different policy makers who are um, connected to the municipality, then we had, have a lot of private establish establishments in the field of culture, etc. Funding supporting agencies and, and all these different stakeholders and, and uh, actors there are, there are um, yeah, playing the game, I would say, of the cultural landscape in Magdeburg. And um, in our interviews with uh, the stakeholders, we were able to find out a little bit about this dynamics in this uh, in this cultural landscape. And in our first interview, um, uh, it was told, um, I brought you this quote, um, uh, you have to imagine that in the cultural scene, in my opinion, everyone knows everyone in Magdeburg. Yes, so everyone had had contact with everyone because everyone has also asked everyone for help somehow. That means, so to speak, everyone knows each other, but of course not everyone likes each other. So you have, um, so to speak, always people who are somehow envious or some certain stupid reasons that, um, for some st certain stupid reasons that should not actually exist. There we got interested really in this dynamics. Um, and to give you a really uh, brief insight um, into our results, I tried to visualize our findings here a little bit. Um, um, in uh, sh short, uh, we found that um, we have a really complex network structure in the um, cultural landscape in Magdeburg, which is characterized by a lot of tension. We have there are different groups of belongings, um, um, so to say, uh, different bubbles of stakeholders with their own goals, norms, competences, and understandings of culture as well, and of course, what culture should be. And in this um, whole um, yeah, network, um, there are um, new um, uh, new project ideas made up, they support each other, they have um, yeah, collaborations, um, but also there are a lot of conflicts and tensions and um, a lot of borders between um, yeah, different um, uh, bubbles of stakeholders and uh, and, and this um, constructions of of belonging. Um, this is what I like to visualize with this uh, yeah yeah little icons here. <laughs> so this does not um, represent um, the landscape in Magdeburg um, in detail. Just to give you an an idea how um, uh, uh, um, on what kind of um, dynamics and movements we found in the interviews. Um, yeah, um, based on that finding, um, at the end of the project, um, we uh, co-created uh, with um, Kerstin Hartinger a, um, a feedback and discussion event. Um, to, to this event, we invited um, uh, yeah, um, all stakeholders um, of Magdeburg's uh, cultural life, which were in the um, reach of Kerstin Hartinger, uh, who was a really good um, connected in the cultural landscape because of the working um, um, on the application. And um, in this uh, feedback and discussion, we um, did an online presentation of the results and um, we set up two sessions um, in order to, um, uh, to to bring the stakeholders in Magdeburg together, and one on strategies and challenges of audio, audience development and marketing in Magdeburg, and second one on um, cooperative relationships and collaboration in Magdeburg's cultural landscape, because these two focuses were, were the ones where we um, where we found, or based on, an, on our interviews, where, where um, they were the focus, where the interest of, um, this, um, of the landscape, so to say, lies. So that's the relevance we, we found there. Um, we had um, 46 people from different cultural institutions um, there, and um, uh, during the sessions, we um, um, we recorded um, uh, our presentations and um, we wrote um, extensive protocols of the discussions that are shared this with everyone. Um, and um, yeah, this was our feedback event. Our, but 
nevertheless, our main goal was to bring different stakeholders together in order to stimulate new collaborations within the cultural landscapes. Uh, because of this um, borders and conflicts and tensions we made out. So th this was our idea was to create a, a, a opportunity from um, a, a neutral position, so to say, from the university to bring people together um, and maybe um, enhance with that the possibility that new um, collaborations um, uh, will come up in the in the time after the project. Um, we did that because um, we found in our data as well um, uh, systematically, systematically that um, just like here in the quote, um, that the approach to um, involve as many people as possible uh, as possible in the projects um, sh seems one to be that's really um, uh, really capital uh, for um, for reaching a broader audience and make um, make uh, cultural events and um, offers a success. Um, so here um, our interviewers said, my experience is that you make it work by involving as many people as possible. So everyone shows up and asks, uh, show, sorry. So everyone who shows up and asks to join in can join in um, in some way, uh, even if you have reservations, etc. cetera, um, you have to approach them with open arms first. Um, and I think we really had the approach to um, um, to take this message, uh, this message, and um, um, uh, yeah, reflect it back into the community um, in order that new um, projects maybe um, arise from that. Um, just um, coming to an end, our two top lessons learned, I would say are that um, we were operating in a field of very high expectations, um, uh, especially at our um, uh, last feedback event. Uh, there um, we had uh, the impression that um, from the stakeholders, um, we from the university were perceived as the one um, who can tell you how things work. Um, and there we uh, thought um, that we really had, uh, should have, have spent more time in our communication strategy um, on how we uh, frame this whole event and how we frame that what we did. And on the other hand, we were um, we learned that we were associated in the pro process with the city. And um, that influenced our position from our, our university position in the place and um, how we were perceived. Um, we we uh, were uh, uh, I would say really, um, yeah, put to a test where we are in the place and in the in the cultural landscape and how we are related to the city because there are a lot of conflicts as well between the municipality and um, the cultural actors um, and the cultural um, stakeholders in Magdeburg as well. So there we had a lot of work on uh, to um, make sure in what kind of positions we were as the university. And with that. Um, I like to end this brief introduction to our projects and now we have time for questions and discussion. Thank you, Tim. That was really great. Um, I think two very different, but both kind of really interesting presentations about how um, the project has gone and how the project has kind of sought to um, build that relationship between the city and its citizens and the university and bringing in research and trying to bring in um, people at the right time at the right point to be able to support rather than necessarily coming in um, with an agenda at the very start. Um, I think I'm conscious that I think we have both of the discussion groups here um, and I think that the other discussion group was going to look at kind of how you build those long term relationships. Um, I wonder if the, the speakers from the other session would like to kind of quickly go over the, the kind of presentations that they were going to, to make. I mean, there probably isn't time to make those presentations, but I think there's probably time just to come to, to kind of go through and highlight some of those lessons. Um, who would who'd like to go first? Uh, yeah, I, excuse me. 
Hi, Stephanie. Thank oh. you. <laughs> yes, I, I did prepare a presentation, but after two, I do feel that maybe the attention for another presentation is a bit uh, down. So uh, maybe we can open up the floor and talk about we've done, we've done these beautiful projects and uh, what can make them go, uh, what are the main obstacles that we've all found uh, concerning these long-term and sustainable um, relationships? And have how is everybody trying to overcome these, yes or no? Um, yeah. I can sketch from Delft, but yeah, I don't know if everybody's waiting for another ten minutes of listening to. Uh, no, no, let's 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 have a chat if we possibly can. Shall we talk then about some of the challenges and how people overcome them? Um, I know that in Exeter, the more that we kind of, um, it's 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 becoming more significant for the university to be working in this kind of way and that kind of brings its own limitations because the university tends to be quite um, overbearing if it's not careful so we're finding that we're having to work harder and harder mm -hmm. to make sure that the community element is genuine and is really um, <laughs> part of what we're doing um, what about what about other people what what kind of challenges when you were doing your projects did you did you come across how did you how did you get past them Other than COVID, obviously. Well, uh, if I can tell something from Delft, we've seen that um, uh, in Delft, uh, uh, money came from the Ministry of Education to uh, to st uh, to experiment with pilots on uh, uh, bringing together the, the demands from the society in specific regions and cities, and um, the knowledge from the research institutions. And in Delft, there was appointed by this money uh, a knowledge broker. Uh, what we've seen is that this has given really a push to working together uh, in Delft between three knowledge institutions and um, and the city of Delft, specifically a neighborhood, and there and the questions coming out of that neighborhood. Um, we saw that the community was leading uh, and it worked really well also because the knowledge broker it has an independent position. Uh, however, the, the question then is, after two years of experimenting and being all very positive about this uh, role and position of the knowledge broker, what if the ministry uh, pulls back and says, and now if it's so positive, like now it's up to you. Um, and so I know that Katja was uh, also involved in the board of, of this knowledge broker and uh, evaluating with us. Um, there, there have been a lot of conversations about how do we push this forward. And I think one of the challenges was um, can we all make money uh, available for, uh, should it all be like, should the three knowledge institutions bring in as much uh, as a city uh, who benefits most from the relationship? Um, yeah, and how do we go about that? Um, I do feel, I think Katja, if I'm uh, not incorrect, they did push for another year at least, and this money is mostly from the city, if I'm correct. But oh, it's, show you. Oh, I, um... And it, because it's now it's an uh, an urgent question um, in Delft uh, because the uh, subsidy will stop at the end of this year. Um, so what they now decided uh, the partners involved is that they will divide the amount of money which was given as a subsidy from the national government and divide it uh, between the, the different partners involved because they really wanted to keep this independent position. Um, uh, of the knowledge broker, but it's for upcoming year. And of course, this is also once again very um, vulnerable as a construction, especially as, for example, the municipality of Delft has uh, also financial issues. And for them, it, it, probably it will be the first thing which will, um, well, will, we, we, in which they will um, um, cut their expenses, probably, we assume at least. Uh, not because they they don't see the, the necessity of a knowledge broker, but just it's something extra. And um, well, in hard times, it, it will be the first thing we are afraid of that they might not be um, uh, able to to spend another year or to have another year um, of funding. Um, so that will be something for 2023. But of course, it's also an example of how difficult it is to make these these more uh, long term yeah. um, constructions, basically. Hmm. No, that's a shame. What about other people? Are they in a, are they kind of in similar positions to that? Does that ring a lot of bells? Uh, 
I can say something about our project in Magdeburg um, there. Um, yeah, we have um, kind of the classic situation. Um, um, my contract ended and um, now the, the main worker for the project is, is gone. <laughs> but um, we made use of um, uh, Philip's uh, yeah, teaching duties. And um, th this is something that will stay um, with him um, in the University of Magdeburg. And um, um, so it's really up to um, right now to Philip's um, engagement and his connections to the city. And uh, with that, um, we can um, continue this partnership, um, even if um, Kerstin Hartinger is now in, in, in a different city as well. Um, there, um, maybe Philip, you got some um, uh, new yeah. insights into the project. We were in touch with different um, uh, um, departments from the city who were um, interested in, in collaborations. Um, and, and the main we we. Um, vehicle for that um, will be, I would say, the teaching and maybe further upcoming projects. Yeah, thank you, Tim, for reminding me and placing that burden on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this section is being filmed. I think you're OK. <laughs> I'm OK, yes. <laughs> no, um, the thing what maybe needs to be the, to be added to this is uh, the importance of the whole thing for the development of Magdeburg as a city, because it's a city in transition. It is part of the former uh, GDR and has seen lots of um, severe uh, losses in terms of economic uh, power and so on and so on. And that also uh, led to a, um, to a loss of social capital, which in, led then to non-participation in cultural life. And we think that stimulating cultural life leads to uplifting social capital then leads to uplifting economic activities and so on so it's it's more than just revitalizing theaters or so it's also a part of stimulating other sorts of activities in in a city which is in still in transition right and uh, this is why it's important beyond what we do with the, the specific view to the cultural activities as such and this is why we as a university and, and the Department of Humanities in the university is uh, engaged with this. Um, and uh, even though I could not tell when the next specific activity and teaching and learning activity of my chair will be, uh, we will be involved in this uh, for, for the next couple of years at least, I think. Right. I mean, you know what it's what it's what it is like when you work in a university. There are other duties which are coming across and then things uh, which you don't have any funding for are getting uh, a bit out of sight. But um, still, it is as, as I tried to describe it, it is it is a, an extremely important part of our research activities. And when I when I say our research activities when I, I'm speaking for the whole um, university. Um, specifically the, the humanities department, but also our engineers. We are almost a technical university. Also our engineers are very much involved uh, in these debates uh, with regard to um, um, the development of, of the city as um, a lively place. I mean, and really on that on that theme of kind of a lively place. Um, how many of the projects um, closely involved students in their in their delivery? Were they a part of? I, I think they're okay. Um, it's something that we'd like to do more of. Yeah. And I think most of them did in some shape or form. And I remember this being point of discussion in. Ghent, I think, you know, because I think I was surprised. I think because initially when we set out with the idea of this project, I and perhaps it's because of my research background and, and I don't do teaching, but it, it I thought that this was going to be more about research. And I think it surprised me how many of projects did draw in students in one way or another. And I think that is is quite important as a as a lesson because I, I think that in order to continue most of these projects, and I think it's the point that I made this morning, you know, I think looking for ways to embed teaching into the projects is, is really key because I think students 
are, you know, and again, getting back to the fundamental point that whatever we do in terms of um, community university partnerships, you know, it's, it's got to benefit both partners. And as a, an institution, the university is not going to be able to sustain anything that doesn't benefit either teaching or learning. And I think through teaching, we've got just that one mechanism that we can continue to engage with groups, for external organisations. It provides some longevity from one year to another. We can look at ways of embedding um, projects and making them run from one year to another. And I think probably students are our best resource in terms of looking at the sustainability of most of these projects. Mm. That makes sense. It does. It does. And I, and I guess it, it would be around about how do the partners ensure that that happens? Because students, by their very nature, are quite transient. They'll be with us for, say, two, three years of which they may only have certain parts of their kind of of their three years when they will be available for doing community work or working in volunteering in different ways. And um, there's quite a lot of pressures on them. So how how do you actually do that? Lots of students coming behind them. There will. There's a program that allows, allows you know that to continue from one year yeah. to another. Yeah. I think it was um, Katia that I heard talk about relay projects. Once was it was it relay projects or something like that, Katia? That basically, you know, you one, one student starts a project one year, another project, another student picks that up and continues it the next year. Is that a Dutch thing? Yeah, we, we try to set up in indeed a re relay in uh, also with different uh, institutes so and different levels of uh, of students um, background. So from lower vocational educational programs up to universities. Um, but well, at the end, it's it, it, it's it's it still is difficult basically to have uh, students from different institutes and from different um, uh, levels um, to have them um, to have a, a good relay build up but it was quite successful but unfortunately we we um, couldn't have it the whole um, set up uh, due to corona so um, what we're trying to figure out for next year again um, but it, well this relay or um, working together on thesis projects that is basically for us the ways in which we can work together with students from different areas and institutes because it's the most practical way basically where you, where you can uh, when, when where you can organize uh, students working together that's a good idea um are there any more reflections on um the the kind of the the pilots that we've heard Alexis. Well, maybe not really on, on, on one of the pilots in particular, but just on the involvement of students. Although I, of course, agree that involving students um, is, is, is a good way to, to, to make some projects more sustainable. But they are also maybe sometimes too often perceived as cheap resources that we can use. And as I think uh, Katja already mentioned, it's not always easy for practical reasons, specifically if you work across countries with different universities with different uh, educational objectives so that's not always easy that's one thing but also from our faculty where we um, some of teachers not me personally but uh, a colleague of mine uh, works to together uh, a lot and gives students assignments to also work with vulnerable populations um, in specific neighborhoods where there are uh, complex issues to tackle and uh, one of the drawbacks is also that often these students go out in the field they organize focus groups, interviews, uh, stuff like that with vulnerable groups. And, uh, and sometimes afterwards, um, some individuals that have been interviewed feel that they are um, yeah, left or, or that, um, that uh, the students come, they do their thing for one year, they write their master thesis, and then it's finished and then they disappear. And uh, people are still left out there with their problems. So you see this sometimes also creates uh, the, the 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 thing that that uh, academia is also sometimes opportunistic, where they use people to do research, to to gather information, but there is always that moment where it stops and where people uh, feel like, yeah, where are they now when I need them? So this is, I think, also something which we um, uh, should think about when we um, 
when we launch projects together with with, with students. So they can certainly um, yeah, uh, have an important uh, impact as well. But um, we should also keep in mind that it's not all, only about uh, making sure that students learn, but also uh, carefully and ethically think about the impact that they have when they go into the field and work with real people with, with real problems. So that's just, just one, one uh, comment. Yeah, Lindsay, and then Tim. Sorry, just just briefly. Yeah, I suppose again, it comes back down to managing expectations, doesn't it? You know, and um, I absolutely agree. The whole sort of parachuting in and doing short-term projects is is not in any way, shape, or form good. But I think when we are working with students and communities, it's managing expectations of both sides and um, helping the organisation understand the the limitations of of students, not just in terms of their capabilities, but their longevity. Um, but yeah, and just trying to make sure that both parties understand what's in it for them and and what the long term implications are. Tim, you had your you had your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, just with regard to the uh, thesis that um, students are like a, a cheap workforce, for example, in in, in our. Um, case um, we spend so much work on qualifying them and um, working with them on the projects and um, yeah, setting everything up that um, um, I, I, I cannot disagree more that uh, this was a lot of work <laughs> to, to the um, uh, uh, for the qualification and um, all the method training etc the um, um, the basic education on um, yeah, research methods, etc. This was really time consuming. And um, for for me um, personally, it was more like yeah, giving the students the opportunity to participate in a project um, which is a real world project. It's not like a, um, a, um, a, uh, yeah, a thesis they have to write or a um, term paper they have to finish. It um, was the opportunity to, to participate in our um, socially against your university project. And um, there, that was really my motivation with that. And um, I think that this is something um, students really appreciate as well. Um, Joe. Oh, yeah, um, I was just uh, thinking about um, uh, our organization or our group of tidelines as being uh, an intermediary in that process the, between the students and the community. And that, um, I mean, the way the way it works with us communicating, uh, in particular with the Global Systems Institute in Exeter, is to um, raise those questions, as I mentioned, and then to put those out as 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 interest for students to develop their interests around so they kind of come to us but the the other thing is that um the um the students come in and out of of tidelines or they come in and out of uh, of a community group as it is so the community in the group as in tidelines kind of takes that responsibility of maintaining connection with the community so the students can come and go Nobody's offended by their sudden dis sudden departure and they're uh, left behind because the hopefully tidelines is 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 handing over the responsibility to the community to develop the interest themselves. So there has to be this transfer to the community to have to be empowered to be the ones actually doing the research to which the student contributes rather than is the the, you know, the visitor and departer. Just a thought. It's this uh, intermediary organisation that is perhaps is needed. I think that intermediate role is a really interesting one. And when and when organisations like Tidelines exist, it does make life an awful lot easier. It's it's not easy to kind of invent something that will occupy that space. Um, unless everyone's willing to kind of put their money into it. And we've seen again the reflections on then when people's budgets start to be looked at. Um, Lindsay. Sorry, me again. No, I was just thinking about that again, John. I think some of the best models that I've seen elsewhere 
Um, and certainly here in um, UCL in London, they've got a really nice model called the Evaluation Exchange. And that is a process which brings students, and it's normally postgraduate students, together with an organisation. And they are trained together in the process of, evalu of evaluation. So the student goes in and develops an evaluation plan with the organisation. They both develop those skills together um, with sort of supervision. And at the end of the day, the, the student is left with evaluation skills. The organisation has got an evaluation plan to help them evaluate their intervention or whatever it is. But they've also got the skills then within their organisation to be able to do that process the next time. So it's about upskilling together, sort of student and organisation together. And I think that is, that's a really nice model. If, if you know you can find something else sort of a, a, in that sort of ballpark, I think it re works really, really well. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, is there any more reflections or, or, or kind of questions or statements that people would like to make about their, how, their, how the projects have gone? Or how, do they have any questions about how others have, have managed to overcome problems that they, that they face? I sense that we might be about to have one, Lindsay, here in terms of as our work becomes more important at the centre, how do we make sure that um, we avoid that top-down approach? But, I, you know, it's your job, so I'm sure you'll manage it. Good luck. OK. OK, then uh, I think that at this point we are in a plenary session because all of us are here. And at this point, um, I think that uh, the moderators of the first and the second par session um, could uh, report the main results from the Paris sessions and there won't be need for uh, for this last uh, Paris session to make a report I think we will go straight after uh, Mariana for the first Paris session and uh, Alexis I would str uh, straight go to the um, lead the conclusions if you all agree yeah, OK, so I give the floor to Mariana for the first parallel session on trust and then Alex. Yeah, if Hermadinda can make me administrator to share my screen, please. Are you able, Mariana? No, no. No? Why? <laughs> non sono ancora come relatore. L'avevo già schiacciato. Adesso sì. Ah, okay. ok, perfetto. Ok. Thank you. So, here we are. In our group, um, we launched the question, how to nace the trust between local stakeholders and the university? And we formulated four questions and we tried to record uh, uh, some main points uh, that emerged on, from the discussion. So the first point was how to recover stakeholder trust. We consider that uh, um, it's often that stakeholder had create a, a mistrust <laughs> toward the uh, uh, institution, toward the uh, local institution or university or sometimes association uh, because of uh, um, they, they had bad experience in past times. So uh, sometimes it's very difficult to uh, start a new project with trust. So uh, the main points that we uh, underlined were the first one that the university play a neutral role. So it's important to consider that university um, can have an important role to uh, coordinate and uh, create a dialogue among all different stakeholders because of uh, um, its neutral role. 
The second point is that we consider that it's very important to be realistic about what we are able to achieve as a university and consider the reality. So uh, it's very important to communicate from the beginning uh, which is the role of the university and we, what the university can really do um, in order to avoid uh, um, a, 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 a false expect expectation from the partner. So uh, it's very important to define from the beginning which are our uh, capability, possibility and what we can do. And the third point is the empowerment. So try to involve stakeholder in meeting and make the stakeholder part of the process, um, trying to share responsibility. So from the beginning, the beginning is important to make that the stakeholder um, find and feel themselves resp responsible for all the process, not just someone who receive feedback or receive input from other institution. So the second question was how to create dialogue to understand stakeholders need. So first of all, uh, it's important to uh, create a, dia a dialogue can, that can be sincere and transparent. Uh, um, a proactive dialogue that can be um, built through meeting, uh, especially trying to go to a stakeholder place, for example, in our case, uh, to go to the mountain area, try to, to uh, speak with the farmers in, in their farms and uh, um, show empathy in all this process. The third question is how to establish a long lasting relationship with the stakeholder. So um, we consider that's very important to give feedback to stakeholder about the research results that can be input for planning their strategies. This because um, more times what happens is that the stakeholder consider that university just uh, um, go to their reality to, to collect data and to write their own paper. So we think that's very important to, um, to make sure that the, the flow of information can be a mutual flow. So a university receive information from the stakeholder but can give back uh, results, uh, idea and input. And it's also important that the, the output that the university can produce are very concrete outputs. So um, to help stakeholders to understand that can be useful to, to maintain this relationship for their interest. The first one is what tools can be provided to the students for a deeper understanding of the stakeholders' need. So we think, first of all, that third mission must not, must not be conceived as a, par a parallel activity of university. It should become a mainstream activity. And to do that, we need to change the methods and content of teaching, introducing social research methodology and participatory techniques. And we were uh, speaking about um, introducing this kind of uh, methodology um, even if our students are not human, students of humanist area, maybe they can be economists or engineering, but if we want to involve them in the, uh, social engaged activity, it's very necessary to, to teach them um, new techniques and new um, method, yeah, um, social uh, research methodology. And it's very important to emphasize participation and critical thinking. So uh, our university, especially the Italian one, is very frontal uh, based university. So um, students are not very used to uh, participate, to ask, to, to, to reflect uh, all together. So it's very important to change this kind of uh, uh, method and involve them from the beginning in all area of university. OK, these are the main points, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Marianne, uh, OK, it's Alexis turn. OK, thank you. Uh, I did not make nice slides, so <laughs> I'll try to do this just by talking to you and 
<laughs> as a person. Um, so basically, our session was about intersectoral collaboration, which is a, a big a mouthful, uh, and refers to a pilot project that we conducted in the city of Ghent at the Kaiserspark, where there is a lot of nuisance caused by, uh, well, a lot of use, where there is a nuisance caused by some youths that are also sometimes involved in criminal activity. So basically, we brought together different types of stakeholders to uh, to discuss this issue and to discuss how we can tackle this problem at the park. So we brought together police, uh, representative from the prosecutor's office, uh, staff members from the city of Ghent, uh, youth association and uh, health professionals, and of course, researchers. And uh, so the idea was, okay, how can we tackle this problem? So we were confronted with uh, several issues. One of the first tasks that we uh, that we did and we, we, we basically set up a trajectory of uh, four co-creation sessions where first we we identified mm -hmm. the, the shared goal what is our shared goal what do we exactly want to do huh? because different uh, people from different institutions come with different expectations this has already been been mentioned and then one of our first actions was to develop a brochure a brochure that explains basically how every organization works huh? There was a lot of a uh, misunderstanding uh, about uh, between uh, stakeholders uh, because they did not uh, knew or were not aware of how each organization uh, actually works. So, so the brochure was the first specific action, and I think, um, yeah, to to sum it up, I think the, the 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 final brochure was maybe less important than the process itself, where we were able to uh, work around this uh, shared product of a brochure and in the and and by doing that uh, we're able to develop a, a climate of of trust and also uh, the stakeholders learned about each other and how everyone works exactly um i already said people come with different roles they have different mandates you are not, it's not because you have one representative from the city of Ghent, for example, that this person can actually represent that institution as a whole. So it's uh, it's all about getting clear what this person can do and what this person actually wants. Um, what also appeared important uh, because of the, the misunderstandings and the lack of trust was the importance of feedback loops. How do we make sure that persons are informed about what, what, uh, what they do, eh? for example, when the police intervenes at the park, how do we make sure that also the youth association that is active in the park, that they are also aware of why the police intervenes and, and, uh, and what, are the, uh, what the consequences are of this intervention. So these feed, feedback loops uh, were important. Um, there was also quite some debate about the sharing of information. And since this is about specific individuals, specific youth, there were, of course, all kinds of uh, confidentiality issues. And uh, that is where we then uh, basically uh, decided, well, we need to work on two different levels. The one is basically um, developing a formal protocol that allows organizations to share information based on a legal, uh, on a legal base. This is a long-term aim. We could not solve this in eight months' time. This will probably take years to achieve that, but it still is an important one. The other one, and uh, this was, I think, more easy to, um, to achieve, was basically sharing information on a more informal level. And because of the fact that uh, a climate of trust was created, uh, participants said, well, now there is actually quite some even confidential information that we can informally, between the lines, as they call it, share with each other. Um, yeah, involving end users, in our case, the youth themselves, this, this, this was an issue. We did not succeed for practical reasons because it was only a, a very a short period of time, this pilot project. But uh, in the meantime, the city of Ghent took the initiative to interview uh, people at the Kaiserspark, even make a documentary. And uh, uh, in doing that, they uh, were able to shed some light on the lives, the needs, and the specific circumstances in which these youth live. Um, of course, uh, on a longer term, working with end users um, can be achieved, I think, by involving uh, youth representatives, for example, but also in other cases, uh, working with, uh, for example, uh, patient organizations with uh, people with lived experiences and so on. Uh, during our session, there was also the 
question was also raised about sustainability. How do you make these projects sustainable when they are only for a limited amount of time? So also the yeah, collaboration with students was mentioned, but uh, and also about planning uh, collaborations to be sustainable on the lo long term also means that you think about this in advance. Um, there was also referred to the issue of challenge-based learning. This is, uh, well, high on the, the agenda of, of, of Ghent University, but that does not mean uh, we, we've referred to that uh, in this discussion as well. There are a lot of practical issues to tackle also to uh, to involve students and to make sure that they can actually learn from, from these practical experiences. And then uh, there was also an example mentioned about um, where uh, um, senior citizens were involved in uh, developing better services for senior citizen, citizens, uh, tackling also the issue of loneliness amongst senior citizens by introducing a, a platform, a kind of a tool in the houses of senior citizens senior citizens that helps actually uh, to connect these citizens with um, uh, with health care workers. And then I think finally, uh, uh, brokerage has also, I think, been mentioned, the importance of brokerage, uh, people that connect, that, uh, uh, that can connect uh, actors in the field, for example, with uh, youth representatives. Uh, and make sure that uh, effectively th that these uh, projects are also sustainable on the long term. Uh, but uh, as Katja also mentioned, it, this is also about funding and having long-term fun funding for these kind of brokers uh, to be able to uh, to uh, develop uh, a plan for a longer term. So I think that's a bit it for my session. If I forgot anything, please. Okay, Alexis, thank you very much. It's very interesting to see how different pilot projects brought us to some uh, topical concepts uh, and that we are sharing the same concept. After all, trust, empowerment, long-lasting relationships, neutrality of the university, resources are just uh, concepts that are crossing all the pilot projects. And that's very interesting because they were very different, but still uh, the main points are uh, are shared among the projects. OK, um, if you agree, uh, I, I wouldn't repeat <laughs> the main conclusion of the a third session because uh, all of us were together so we all listened and at this point I would give the floor to Lindsay uh, you know to draw the main uh, findings and conclusions on this uh, project and the main take-home messages we want to uh, bring home and um, also what's next what can we do for the future? Mm, good question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Firstly, I've had a great day. Thank you ever so much, everybody. And, and definitely thank you so much to the Palmer team. Um, I know that this wasn't as we'd first imagined it. It wasn't in person. Um, but I think you've still done a really good job of bringing together some great speakers this morning. Really enjoyed both of our guest speakers, who I don't think are still with us now. But um, it was really good to hear from them. So thank you so much for bringing this all together. Um, in terms of thinking through um, our lessons learned, um, that hasn't quite gone to plan for me because I had put together the Padlet and I was hoping that we could have gathered thoughts and reflections throughout the day. For some reason, I don't think I set that up properly, so I don't think people were able to access it. Um, so what I've just been doing is I've been listening to people over the last sort of half an hour or so. I've been writing notes, um, but I think really none of this is going to be of any surprise to you. These are all things that have come out from the discussions that we've had. Well, first of all, through each of our outputs, I think the same themes have begun to emerge through each of the outputs. The conclusions have been saying broadly the same things, you know, and definitely listening to people today, you know, as, as um, Cecilia just mentioned, we're talking about the same things like trust, empowerment, they, they've all emerged. So what I've, I've just made a list of, of things 
that I sort of picked up throughout today. And I think if we can just use this as a bit of a you know shout out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a list of lessons that I think we've learned from the university's point of view, and then try and think of it from uh, the community partners' point. Of view. That list isn't so long, so Joe or anybody else who's here that's got you know that the experience from the other side as it were help me out with that one and then if we think about you know what we think we want from the funders policymakers and you know other broader lessons learned so can we just make this a bit more of a discussion i've i've got my list here but from the university's point of view i've written trust first of it first of all and i think that is the one thing that has come through in absolutely everything that we've done i've written that it takes time to earn that people often see the university as a powerful organisation which only looks out to benefit itself. Um, I've said that we need to be transparent and open. We need to understand and learn from previous relationships and projects. We need to celebrate successes, but be honest about when things have gone wrong. And we need to try to solve conflicts as they arise. And something that's come out from uh, that last session just before lunch, third mission should be seen as a parallel activity of the university. It should be embedded in our teaching and research. And I think that is something that Guglielmo tried, you know, was very strong about getting across. Has anybody else got anything to say about trust? Now, the next thing I've written down is shared vision and goals. So I said projects work best when there's mutual interest and mutual benefit. It's not that the university's place to solve all societal problems, and often there are other experts out there who can solve them better than we can, and sometimes we are better off leaving it to the experts. But for partners to succeed, the university must gain from the partnership. And I think from my experience, what I mean from this is that in order for a partnership to succeed, really, it's got to be able to enrich or enhance either our teaching or research at the university. You know, we can't get involved with everything um, and it's not going to be sustainable if it's not enhancing something, you know, within our university or, or not adding value to, to our university in itself. So I don't know if anybody's got anything to add or comment about that. I think most universities will have strategies that will somehow incorporate this um, and so it, it, it comes down to how well resourced that is mm. um, because I've, we've just launched a brand new University of Exeter um, 2030 strategy um, lots of fireworks and excitement across the city um, but you know we see that people are huge you know they're one of the most important elements and we see the place is one of the most important important elements and we see the research is one of the most important elements but it's clear that one of those is going to get enormous amounts of emphasis and staff and etc so it's just a question of how do we ensure that um you know it's it's yes it's important that it's written down but how are, what are the structures that sit under that and who are the staff that sit under that and actually make it all happen mm. yeah resources very very key I've written power. Remember that the university is a large institution. It's difficult to navigate as an outsider and to find the right point of contact. University bureaucracy is usually ridiculous for those who work there to understand. Consider this from the partner's perspective. I think Joe might have something to say about that. <laughs> You're on Sorry. mute, Joe. No, no, I, I've, learned to, I've learned a new language. <laughs> I've... Well, could you teach it to me now, then, please? Um, and on power, I've just said, you know, I think we need to be patient again as a university. We need to be patient um, and remember that, you know, try and get parity when we when we are working with community partners, make sure that we are making sure that all the voices can, can be heard, whether we're working with a large organisation or just individuals, you know, we've got to make sure that those individuals feel that they are equal to us, despite our big size. Um, I've written about students. I've, I've written something that Alexis might condemn me for, but I've said students are a fantastic resource. <laughs> and I totally get what you mean, you know, and I think they are exploited in some situations, but at the end of the day, they are our bread and butter, but they are there to get an education. And I think we can improve their education by, um, 
giving them real world experience, you know, some embedding community engaged learning in, in what they are doing and giving them an opportunity to apply what they're learning in the classroom to a real world experience. Um, I think it's just, it, it, it's a win-win situation. If we can get more community engaged learning embedded in our curricula to be able to enable the students to respond to societal challenges, it just makes perfect sense um, all around. Um, but yes, we do need to manage expectations on both sides. And I do agree that students ought to be rewarded in some way, and whether that's through course credits or through payment through internships, um, or we have something here called the extra reward. You know, so it's a digital badge that they can put on their CV. But I think, yes, they do need to be rewarded in some way for what they do. So that's that was my general list for the, for the university, things that, that we've learned from this project. Has anybody got anything that they, I'm sure I've missed lots of things. But anybody else got anything to add? And I just thought about community partners. This, this list is much shorter, I'm afraid. But I've just said the university can be a, a neutral convener. And I think this is something that Alexis really noticed in there. Um, projects, the, the the power of that neutrality and how important it can be in terms of, of helping to develop networks and build trusts. And I think that is something that we can do more of. And certainly here in Exeter, we're beginning to do more of that. Um, for example, there was a local um, issue around street homelessness and antisocial behaviour, and we played an active part in, in being a, a neutral convener, and that really, really helped um, drive that project on. Um, but again, we need to manage expectations, discuss expectations well in advance. And I think this is especially important with regard to understanding the capabilities of whether we are talking about students or researchers, you know, what 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 are the capabilities and what are the time limitations? What what is this going to mean for both sides? And I think that's something that's got to be absolutely clearly um, set out right from the beginning. Um, and I've just said in a note to community partners, please understand that while individual researchers may really want to help and collaborate, they are working with the, within the strict constrict, constraints of teaching, finding funding and publications. And I think for many organisations, you know, they see the university again as this big organisation with lots of money. But at the end of the day, you know, we have a job to do as well. And I think sometimes that's very, very difficult to um, for, for other people to, to understand. Joe, have you got anything else to, to, to say from your point of view, what, what you've learned from, from this project about working with the university? Um, I think that uh, another element to working with the university as an advantage to the university, I think, is, uh, is any form of uh, public of university works. And how you know what it does? There is just quite a cloud, I think, for a lot of people, a, a pre pre assumptions about what the university is and does. And uh, um, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, how does a research? How does research get presented generally outside in the public domain? And uh, I think that uh, I think there's a. I don't know if it it is presented very easily and readily for the public to understand some of the extraordinary things that the university is getting up to. And it would be, so I, I was initially with Tidelines looking for that communication uh, of, um, which I thought would be advantageous to the university to um, be able to be seen to be doing what they're doing in a more public way. Um, kind of still working on that. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I think, um, I think I often think they need a kind of a voice, they need a place, you know, somewhere where um, we can, in a colloquial way, just in a, in a communal, easy way, go and find out what's going on. It's so fascinating, and yet sometimes it doesn't leak out. And that's maybe a, a side thing, really, I suppose, but it's one yeah. of my objectives. But I, I think that is something that we could get better at, is making our research more accessible to, to publics and, mm. and non-academic audiences. I think that that's definitely something that, that we're trying to do a bit better, but uh, I'm sure that we could continue to work harder with that. Well, we, we kind of see it on a personal level many times during the year. 
every time you're in a, in a group of people, um, it's the barriers are just coming down all the time. A group of people who, who live locally, who find themselves talking to uh, a marine biologist, for example, who's really enthusiastic about their subject. And that's just infectious. And they, they share that love of what they do. You find out why the academics do what they do. And it's quite exciting. It's an exciting process to get into, to share those worlds. But it's about providing the spaces where that's possible yeah. to have that crossover. Yeah. Sort of, sort yeah. Of an form. yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get there. But it'll take time. Um, and then I've just made a few final um, points around funding, really. And um, well, no, first of all, I'll go into all partners. You know, I, I, the knowledge broker. I think this is an absolutely um, brilliant idea if it can be resourced. Um, I think it's it's proven that it, it definitely works. Somebody who speaks both languages um, and can see both sides. Um, so I'm really keen to explore how we can um, look at using a knowledge broker, but in a more sustainable way. You know, with with with, with limited resources, are there other ways? You know, are there? Can we look at remote platforms, for example? You know, to I don't know somehow match make. I don't know. I'm just just intri intrigued to think about how we can broker relationships um, on very very minimum resources. Um, and the other thing I've written down for all partners to consider is feedback loops. Somebody just mentioned that. I think that might have been Alexis just a moment ago, making sure that there are opportunities for all partners to, to feed back into the process um, and to be able to adapt the process as you go along and plan for sustainability, build it right in or in right from the beginning. And, you know, I think that's something, you know, we're at the stage now we're thinking what next, but I think, you know, if, if sustainability can be thought of right from the beginning and think about how the project can be um, can be sustained beyond short term project funding, because I think we all know that short term funding can be more damaging than no, no funding at all. Um, so I think on that note, funders, I don't know what it's like in the rest of Europe, but I think what we find here is that funding streams um, are still pretty much quite siloed. You know that we still have uh, arts council funding. We have, um, you know, so they, they've, they directed very much a, a one group of people, arts or scientists or what have you. You know, can we have more funding streams that that respond or, or are open calls to, to more interdisciplinary research um, and that perhaps aren't so dependent on having an academic as a, as a lead, um, Lead, lead applicant, which I think is very much the case here. I don't know whether that is very much the case over there, but I think at the moment we find there are very, very few streams. You know, looking at opportunities to, to continue um, tidelines, there have been very few opportunities that we feel that we would fit into as a project at the moment. And I think it'd be really nice if there are more opportunities for community-led research to be funded. I don't know whether anybody's got any comments on that from, from other countries. No, and of course, not being part of Europe anymore, we no longer are able to apply for Erasmus funding, which has definitely closed many of the doors for us. But I mean, there's horizon opportunities and they don't, it shouldn't necessarily stop other partners. So no. if if the network is doing interesting things, then especially as some of us are, are in the e-universities network anyway, then I think that this kind of topic is something that network meetings will be exploring anyway. So we can get involved. Yeah, and I think on that note, I think, um, Cecilia, you said, what next? Let's have a little discussion about what next, because I know that we are really, really keen to continue this collaboration. We had a meeting with our cast partners a few days ago, and I don't think anybody is here that was at that meeting. Um, but they, too, are very, very keen to continue that collaboration. And there's a lot of crossover um, that project comes to an end um, in about one more year's time. But we are really keen and I think the sensible thing would be to combine forces. Um, that would make seven partners, but I think that is still manageable um, and to look for further funding that allows us to continue working in this area. There's a huge overlap, you know, as I say, I started this project thinking it would be more about research and broader partners. But really, you know, the fact is that we all see the 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 
and the benefit of working with students and the fact that students have been so integral to each of our projects, it makes sense to see if we can look for further opportunities to, to carry on these conversations and these, these projects. So any, any thoughts? Well, I think, uh, Lindsay, as a start, it would be great to have these, the, the merge of these two, two networks. Um, and how to combine it. it, it could be an option that because um, uh, that we are, we will participate in, in the next meetings of coming year from the TUAS University. Um, and then also think over, um, well, the, the I think the first next step will be to, to figure out on which field of area in specific we want to continue working and then try to look for funding with, um, with I think in the Erasmus Plus, we already um, mentioned or we already discussed that I think uh, Alexis, you and uh, from to us, I think we will make a f maybe make a first round of thoughts of uh, which um, call would be interesting or on which field of area. But um, well, these are just some some thoughts. Yeah. Broadly speaking, I think we all agree that it would be nice to continue the collaboration. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's going to be finding the right, right funding stream. Um, and as, as Andy said, you know, even though we can't be part of Erasmus+, Plus, perhaps we can contrib contribute in some way. <laughs> Um, either through evaluation or, I don't know, and and is quite clever at thinking outside the box for these sort of things. I'll do my best. <laughs> okay then. Good. So, are we? Uh, so we we keep, we are now at the uh, final, very very fine <laughs> uh, remarks. And um, maybe uh, some others from the Parma team would like to add something, Guglielmo? No, nothing. Just, just greetings. Just, uh, just, just tell that uh, um, to, 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 Lin, to, to Lindsay that uh, uh, I am sure that uh, there will be occasion to continue our collaboration. Uh, it is true that at the, the European uh, level, uh, there is a strong emphasis uh, now, as you know, in creating uh, a network of European universities, you know, that uh, this is a new pillar of the uh, European strategy on higher education. And of course, the UK is out, uh, but on the same, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the ne network strategy is pursued by all the universities, uh, also with many, many countries outside the European Union. My idea of internationalization, the idea of the University of Parma of inter internationalization is that internationalization is not only Europe, but is the globe. And therefore we are developing networks with many, many countries and of course, uh, for us, the, the participation of the UK is central in uh, this kind of uh, Europe of, uh, of strategy of our of my university, but I think of all other uh, European university universities. So I am sure that there will be a future and uh, for further collaboration. And uh, me and my university will be. Uh, engaged in uh, in uh, promoting uh, this collaboration in the future in a very concrete way. So thank you very much, Lindsay. I think I think that you are you have been an extraordinary coordinator of this project. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I of course with uh, I mean it has been a, a, a great uh, uh, collective work, and uh, I'm really excited about that. But uh, I want also to stress your personal <laughs> uh, role in this uh, in this uh, in this project, which which has been uh, extraordinary 
And you must know that we, we have all appreciated it. So thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> Yeah, you're muted. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> oh, I said such lovely things as well. <laughs> I said thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that wo those words. And also, I, you've just been a wonderful group of people to work with. I, I, I was absolutely um, speaking through the truth earlier when I said that when I first met everybody, when you all came over to Exeter, you know, it was so lovely to meet such a lovely bunch of people. And um, you've all been an absolute delight to work with. And I, I thank you for each of you for keeping on track. You know, each, each of the work package leads have done an absolutely fantastic job at uh, nudging us all along. So I think it's been a tremendous effort on everybody's part. And um, thank you all very, very much. OK, mm -hmm. I think um, we will made available the recordings. I think we can upload them. Uh, on the website, uh, on also on the YouTube channel, maybe uh, Melinda will do it. Uh, yes, yeah, she's confirming, so we will upload them. And um, again, I think that we also have <laughs> to formalize our efforts in a publication. So I'll be back to you in the next weeks to you know to carry on with this project with a publication and uh, yes I, I do hope I, I want to thank you all for your efforts and all the great job you have done and so thanks again and I do hope we meet again in new projects and maybe Horizon we'll see but anyway I think there's so much to do on this on these topics so Hopefully, we will um, again. We will work again together. Okay. Thanks again. So I think uh, it's all now, and see you soon. Hopefully, thanks. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much, everybody. Lovely to see you all. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.